John, however, is here to talk less about the how, the stats, John was not involved in the feasibility study, and more about the why, that economic bottom line that makes it so important for communities to essentially take ownership of their future. So he'll hopefully have a number of case studies and stories from other places, and uh, a great deal of explanation about this new energy world, so without further ado, mm -hmm. thanks John. Up front, I was going to say this is not a church, you can fill the seats in the front row. So, thank you so much for having me. Um, as came down from Minneapolis, we have our own story that I'll share as part of my talk tonight about municipalization you know, uh, and a fight with some utilities. Um, but I want to talk tonight about what it is that makes local power so important. Uh, so, I'm going to run through a few different things. First, we're going to start uh, with the question of why local part one, and it's pub quiz. Let's warm up. So I like to just do this with a lot of my presentations, which is just to help express the enormous opportunity that we have to tap local energy resources. So we start with wind power. I, well, of course, already knows a lot about wind power. But uh, I'm going to ask you a question about the per what percentage of electricity in the state could be served by the wind power potential within the state? <coughs> so this is not a one-to-one you know, -one relationship between how you would actually generate electricity, but just to get a sense of the scale of the potential for renewable energy within the state of Iowa. So do I have any takers on A, 25%? All right, B, 55%. C, 175% the state's energy can be produced from wind within the state. 5,000%, anyone, letter D? Or 27,000%, letter E? Some of you didn't choose. <laughs> the correct answer is 5,200%. So, 50 times more energy could be generated from wind in Iowa at 100 meter hub heights, if you want to get into the details, uh, than, could, than is actually used in the state on an annual basis. So an enormous resource. If you answer 27,000, that's Montana, and it's basically because kind of they're about as windy and have a lot less people. <laughs> the other thing that's really important, though, about renewable energy is it's very cheap. So Excel Energy CEO, Excel Energy is the largest investor in utility that serves Minnesota, Colorado, New Mexico, and a number of other communities. Uh, to point, and he, uh, his seat, their CEO is always talking about now how wind is the absolute cheapest resource. In fact, it is cheaper to build new wind turbines than it is to run old coal plants. So renewable energy is a phenomenal opportunity for us to shift how the system works. There's a second quiz. You didn't realize that there were going to be so many quiz questions. So get a drink and settle it. All right, we're going to ask the same. So same question we did before for wind. What percentage of state electricity? can be served by solar energy, but we're only focusing on rooftops. So we're not talking about putting solar panels in fields like I drove by at Luther College on my way here, just on the roofs of uh, homes and businesses. Hopefully a lot in decor. I don't know if I got exactly right where it is, but it's estimated. So any takers for A, 2%? That can be served by rooftop solar. B, 15%? C, 36%? All right. D, 59%? We're getting more optimistic. I like that. E, 112%. All right. I like it. It's about 36%. <laughs> in fact, that's pretty common across most of the Midwest, around 35 40% of a state's electricity sales can come from rooftops. Now, are we actually going to generate all that? No, because there's lots of reasons why people would put a solar panel on their roof, whether it's shady or not shady, whether or not the roof is a certain age, whether or not the economics work for that individual. Um, but the, the point of the fact is that we just have an enormous resource available in all of our communities. Uh, and, and, the, and the opportunity there uh, is not just about, about cost, but also about uh, whether or not that energy can come locally. So the, the, free answer, the, the first answer to this question of why local is because we can do it, because we have this opportunity we haven't had before, and it's more economical than it's ever been. Why local purchasing? The second one is really just about this issue of choice. So you may have heard of Boulder, Colorado. We had someone else in Boulder to talk. We did in Minneapolis when we were doing our conversation about municipalization. But they took their initial vote in their campaign in 2011. And it's been an ongoing fight. But for them, it was about the chance for their community to determine their own future. Their utility company was making investments in large coal plants that were going to be very expensive, that were going to be expensive for a long period of time. And they wanted to be able to have more say in their energy future. And so for them, it was about lots of different things. It was about the global issue of climate change and pollution, but it was also about clean and competitive power. It was about their economy, it was about their health. There were lots of different reasons, lots of motivations, and they're different for different people in the community. And there are lots of communities that want control over their energy. Over 50 U.S. cities have expressed commitments to 100% clean energy 
Uh, you can see them in the yellow or in the orange color. And many other cities have also expressed a commitment to the Paris Climate Accord. So they want different things than they're getting from their energy companies. And, lots of, and, and very few of these cities actually have control over their energy systems. A lot of these are large cities served by investor-owned utilities just like Decorum. Uh, and, but they are wanting more ability to have control over their energy. One of the things I think is really interesting is there's a state that already is going to have two cities that reach 100% renewable by 2020. They've already like signed the contracts, figured everything out. Uh, so this is question number three for you. What state is it that has two cities that are already going to reach 100% renewable electricity by 2020? California, that's a good guess. Nebraska. Nebraska. New Hampshire. New Hampshire, good guess. Texas. 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 I'm sorry, quicker than I think so now. Georgetown and Denton, Texas are both going to be 100% renewable electricity by 2020. <laughs> They are both municipal utilities. So their contractual obligations on power purchases they are meeting, uh, making rain out. Uh, you may have heard this story if you've heard about Rochester, Minnesota, which is similarly making a commitment to do this by about 2030. Uh, and when they went out to the market to figure out how do we meet the need of our community now that these contracts have expired, they both found that renewable energy was the cheapest possible way to serve that need. So the mix of solar and wind uh, for these communities is gonna meet 100% of their electricity needs. Now that's different from where does the electricity come from every second of every day and which way the electrons flow, which is a matter of electrical engineering. And fortunately for you, not part of this presentation. Uh, but on a contractual basis, their energy is going to be coming from the wind and the sun. There's also a utility that I like to talk about when we talk about local self-reliance. has more solar watts per capita than any other utility in the country. Where is this utility? Any guesses? What is your story? It's in Iowa. Yeah. That's right. Warren McKenna, from Farmers Electric Cooperative uh, in southeastern Iowa. And I think I, one of the reasons I'd love to talk about Warren, well, many different reasons, because he's a pioneer and he's an entrepreneur, but also because this tiny little utility serves just about 650 customers and yet has been able to figure out ways to let their customers invest in clean energy, whether that's community solar, solar on their rooftops. Purchasing through the, uh, uh, you know, their, their cooperative is building and owning their own solar arrays like this one. So there are lots of different ways that they have thought creatively about taking advantage of this local resource. And they're not big. They don't have to be big in order to do that. They just have to be resourceful and take advantage of those uh, local opportunities. So the second answer to why local, the first one is because you can do it. Because we have the clean, competitive energy that allows you to do it. And the second one is because you get to choose. You have a choice then about where you get your energy from in a way that you don't have right now. And that's something that's very important to many communities across the country. So part three, why local? I apologize, this chart gets a little busy. Just don't read all the words in the chart. Just let me talk about it. So there's two parts to this that are important. But the general idea here is we're comparing the cost of generating energy from solar. And from left to right is small solar to big solar. And it's a little different than the charts that you normally see for doing this. So the way I indicate up here is these two apples. Normally we get an apples to oranges comparison where we talk about what is the cost of the energy when it flows out of the power plant. So when else, you might have heard of something like levelized cost of energy. So if you take up the cost of a power plant, you divide up its cost over all the energy it will produce over 20 or 30 years. And that's the way that utilities like to compare the cost of energy. And they say, okay, well the really small stuff, you know, it's expensive to build, relative to the amount of energy it produces, so it's going to be, you know, the bar is going to come up way over here. And our power plants can produce a lot of energy very cheaply because they're very big, and they're over here. But there's a lot of things that are not included in that calculation, and that's what I tried to do in this chart. So here's a few things that I did that are different. Number one is, for anything that was built and is on a rooftop, I take about half the energy and I subtract it out. Because half the energy that comes off a rooftop solar array is generally used by the person who has that solar array there. It's literally used on site. The electrons flow into the building and serve that load, and that's almost the same as if you bought an energy efficient refrigerator, or you got a smart thermostat and started using less energy. So that energy is not having to transact on the grid. That's just going right back into the home. So we can subtract, we can knock down about half the price, if you will, of the power that comes off on the rooftop. So a rooftop solar array might produce energy for 12 cents a kilowatt hour, but the actual cost of the utility to purchase whatever power that person doesn't use is about half that, it's about six cents. Or, you know, it's 12 cents for every one out of every two uh, electrons that come off of that. So these bars go down from the chart that we normally see. The other thing that we don't normally see in this comparison is the delivery cost. And that's what I've added here in the gray bar. So that's the cost of transmission access 
to send that power over long distances because our big power plants are not built right by our cities where we use power most of the time for a very good reason. Uh, it's also the loss of energy that we have when we transmit over that distance, and it's the cost to build and maintain that transmission infrastructure. And so what you find is that from a chart that you normally see where it kind of goes like this all the way down, we sort of flip the equation and local energy can be as cost effective, even from your own rooftop, as energy you might get from a solar array that was built far away. There's actually sort of a sweet spot here, it's like five to 10 megawatts, um, that's slightly cheaper than just about any of the other stuff. But I think it's interesting because it falls very much in the middle in terms of the range of the size of solar energy projects that you see. So I apologize for the complicated charts, but I think it's really important to kind of walk through that because it's something that but flips the conventional wisdom on its head a little bit. The other thing I think that's really important to talk about is that this notion of local spending, like if we build power plants in our community, which is to say put solar arrays on our rooftops, a lot of that money stays in the community, whether that's for the contractor or for the legal work that we might have done or for permitting, all of those dollars stay in the community. And in an analysis that was done by Cross Border a couple of years ago in Arizona, where they were having a lot of big debates about the value of energy, of energy they found that a significant portion of the cost of a solar array that is built on a rooftop in a community actually stays in that community. So about four cents a kilowatt hour. I, I tried to translate this into the same kind of numbers you saw on the first chart. So you think like on my utility bill, I'm usually paying, at least I am in Minneapolis, about 12 cents for every kilowatt hour of energy I use. If I put a rooftop solar array on my home, about four cents of the cost of that energy is actually staying in, that, in our communities because I'm presumably hiring a local contractor uh, maybe buying some local materials, etc. Dollars are staying local. And this is important then when we get to this third chart, which is I take the one before that is kind of looking at the cost of energy from solar from different sizes, and I subtract out that local value from that local spending. Because one of the unique things is if you have a local utility, if you have local control over it, you can make that calculation and you can care about it. Alliant Energy, which is headquartered in Madison, Wisconsin, doesn't care if there's any local spending on it. Excel Energy, in Minneapolis, and its shareholders don't care if the rooftop solar array that we build in Minneapolis has local spending value. It's just not something that's on their balance sheet. It is something that a community controlled utility can have on its balance sheet or in its calculation. And it doesn't have to be the exact values that I have, but it can be taken into account in a way that is not taken into account when the utility company is controlled and owned by other folks. So there's kind of three pieces I think that are really important in this in this answering this question of why do you want a local utility, why do you want to have control of your energy system locally? One is that you can do it. You have the opportunity with the technology that's cost effective to do it in a way that's never been possible before. The second one is that you can choose. You then have the choice and the power over what decision making is made. You can factor in things that other people wouldn't factor in that are important to your community. And the third one is that it can pay because you can invest in energy systems that have more local economic impact and more local benefit than another utility is going to make because they're just doing it on the basis of dollars per kilowatt hour. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit now about what's wrong with the status quo. What is the problem that we have in our energy at large with utilities that are private companies and therefore have a responsibility to their shareholders that are sort of publicly regulated most of the time? And I'll give a couple of examples about how that doesn't always work out the way we hope and what that means for our ability to tap into that cost-effective local energy and potential local benefits. So this one you've probably heard about before. The profits leave our community. The shareholders of our utility company live in the community, and if there are profits from it, and we can presume that there are, that they don't want us to leave their service, there's profits and profits above it. In Minneapolis, we talked about $450 million a year that businesses and residents in the city collectively spend every year for electricity and for gas from our two meter utility companies. We know we're worth a lot of money to them. So when we talked about leaving, they were very interested in preventing that. And I'm sure that's true for any community, and it's you know obviously relative to a community size, but there's always gonna be money and an advantage in, in, in having their customers stick around. There's also the trouble that can be caused when you try to do things that you want that are of local value. So you have this solar project that I just drove by on my way down here, and you had to get a lawyer in order to figure out what is the ownership structure that the utility is going to allow to, to have you do this. So it was a 2015 Iowa Supreme Court case that finally allowed there to be a third party owner of a solar array so that <coughs> economics would work for Luther College to do solar. It's kind of crazy to me to think that it requires that much legal work, that much fighting in order to do something that, to the utility system that's really relatively small. 
And in order to just guarantee that people have a little bit more choice and a little more freedom to tap into the energy that falls on their own property. To me, that seems like something that should be really obvious that we can do. And here I took a, re a legal battle that went all the way up to the state Supreme Court, and it happens in many other states as well. You also have the power to stop energy savings. So Andy was just telling me about a bill down here in the Iowa legislature that would remove the requirement that utilities invest in energy efficiency programs, which are, of course, the least cost way to deliver energy to a community is to not spend the money on the energy in the first place or to build the power plant in the first place. In other states, you see uh, utilities trying to stop the use of what's called net metering, which is the ability that if you hook up your solar panel uh, on your house, to turn your meter backwards to reduce the energy cost that you have to pay. A fascinating story, actually, about the start of net metering back in the 70s in Massachusetts. Uh, the reason that we found out how net the reason we have this policy that when you hook up your solar array to your home and it turns your meter backwards is because that's what happened when the first solar contractor did that to the meter before you told the utility and they found out that it went backwards. They thought, oh, okay, well that's how we'll make the policy about how we compensate for this because that's the best way we know to account for it. Um, another thing that happens is that the incumbent utility, if they've got a vested interest in the profits that they're making and uh, the opportunity that they have, uh, sometimes they use that against communities or against learning new and interesting things. So this was a story by the Energy and Policy Institute. They're a watchdog that there's a lot of looking at how money is spent in the utility business. And they here are telling a story about a trade organization of utilities and how they spent money lobbying uh, the Iowa governor and the legislature to take a solar study that was supposed to be done to look at the opportunities for local solar and what they wanted it to do was to look at the adverse effects of solar if you install it on their utility systems. And what they succeeded in doing was get the Department of Energy to pull the grant funding so the study wasn't done. And there are plenty of other, unfortunately, examples like that. So Alliant Energy spent $88,000 during the 2016 election alone giving money to candidates for office, uh, state legislators, gubernatorial candidates, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get more influence with the people who help decide the rules. Uh, that govern them as a private company that has a public monopoly. And that happens in lots of other states. Excel Energy, which is the largest investor in utility in the state of Minnesota, is running a bill right now. Their nuclear power plant retrofit that they completed about four years ago was about 125% over budget. And utility regulators, in a rare show uh, of, of, of backbone, said you, will, you can get all the costs back from customers for it, but you can't make a profit on it. And now they're at the legislature with a bill that says, this time we want to do it again for our other nuclear power plant, but we want to make sure we can make a profit on it. So I was actually at the legislature last week, and we'll be there again tomorrow, <laughs> this big blank check to help legislators understand what it is that they're signing up for. And I think it's really important to understand, like this, this is a problem with the way the system is run when we have the control is out of our hands, is that these huge companies, Excel Energy is actually a holding company for many state monopoly companies, uh, these investor utilities, has something like 75 lobbyists in the state of Minnesota, one for, one for every three legislators uh, and, and public utility commissioners. And they're at the legislature trying to make sure that they can continue to make profits off this power plant, whether or not it's a good investment for customers. And look, you know, this is an open debate. Some people say, we want to keep the nuclear power plant open. It's low carbon energy. You know, it, it allows us to solve issues of climate change, but instead of having a reasonable process to decide whether or not that cost is worthwhile, they just want to make sure on the front end their shareholders are going to get a benefit out of it, whether or not the customers are. And that is the kind of thing that we always have to be suspicious of, unfortunately, because that is the legal obligation of the company, is to provide value to its shareholders. So it's not even a problem that that's what they do, that is in fact what they are legally required to do. And that is why a lot of times, and increasingly, we find the tension between those investor-owned companies and the communities that they ask them to serve is because they have that commitment, and it is now at odds with communities in a way that it hasn't been for a long time, because the kinds of investments they want to make are not the kinds of investments we might want to make. I thought this was a really powerful quote. So during the fight in Boulder about being a municipal utility, the American Public Power Association, which is a trade group, of municipal utilities. It's basically like their organization to help them trade best practices, whatever. They stay out of politics almost religiously. They will not, they do not like to get involved in these fights over municipalization. But Excel is being such a bad customer, Excel Energy also serves Boulder, Colorado, 
uh, and really shaming and, and blaming about what public power means, uh, he felt obligated, their CEO, to write an op-ed in the Boulder Daily Camera back in 2011 before they took their vote to help explain why it is that utility companies like Excel Energy oppose public power. And I think it is really a good, I'm going to read it out loud because I think it's a really powerful statement. Utilities such as Excel Energy generally oppose the formation of new public power utilities because for them it means the loss of customers and profits. New public power utilities also provide high profile examples of what communities can do for themselves, and this may encourage other cities to form public power utilities. So it's the domino effect. If you read your history books about the Vietnam War and about the Cold War, this is the kind of philosophy that's behind that, which is they're worried that everybody's going to go municipal when they see how great it is. And Excel has spent millions and millions of dollars opposing the effort by Boulder citizens to form a municipal utility because it has already inspired, inspired work that has happened in Minneapolis and in other states. And they know that this is a problem for them, that because their business model is built on having captive customers and being able to agree them for whatever they are worth. Another thing I want to highlight that I think is important is there's all these advantages to having this local control, and there's a lot of things stacked against you in the status quo. But you're not alone in this. There are a lot of other folks out there. First of all, there are 2,000 municipal utilities across the United States. I had to make this map myself. I don't know why the American Public Power Association doesn't want you to know where all of them are. I got a list by state, and we finally got it into a Google map, which takes an appallingly long time to load up, by the way. I'm glad I have a standard yeah. image. They're all over the place, and especially in places like the Midwest, where people and communities for a long time have felt an, uh, the, the ability and the need to have more self, local self, uh, uh, local self-reliance. And so you see that I, if there was a map up here as well of electric cooperatives formed under many of the same circumstances of we're not getting the service we need, we need to take care of this ourselves. There's a lot of that. One of the things I think it's really important to highlight about this is that you will hear stories from the incumbent utility about the disaster that will happen if you form a municipal. You know, Alliant is a big company, we have all of these resources, you're gonna lose that if you go out on your own. There's a thing called mutual aid among all municipal utilities, so which says that if something bad happens in your service territory, we'll all come help you out. We'll bring in our resources and our linemen and our trucks and make sure that you're taken care of. And, and we expect you to do the same for us. It's the kind of thing that was invoked down in Florida and in Texas after the recent hurricanes. In Puerto Rico, where people were sending resources there, Puerto Rico is actually a municipal utility, so there was an offer for municipal utilities uh, in the mainland to send resources down there. So there is an interconnectedness. You don't have to be big in order to, uh, uh, to, to participate in, in having this control. There's also, and the reason these are all clustered is because this uh, community choice thing is based on state law. But you can see there are hundreds of communities that have made their own choices about where their power comes from. Community choice is a really interesting hybrid on municipalization. It says you don't have to buy the poles and wires. The incumbent utility still owns those. It's just that we sort of make them a commons, and the city is now allowed, on behalf of all of its residents and businesses, to choose where the energy supply comes from. This is actually a huge thing right now out in California, where as much as three quarters of all the customers or investor-owned utilities live in cities that have declared that they are on the path to doing community choice, to choosing where their energy comes from, because they are finding that it is cheaper and more available to do that. And so the investor-owned utilities are in a panic there, and spending a lot of money in the legislature trying to slow that process down. Because I think they did just get a moratorium to do programs, temporarily at least. The other, the other way that you're, you're being part of the community, whether or not you're part of Alliant Energy or not, is these really boring things called independent system operators, which are the nonprofit entities that help manage the flow of power over the large grid system. So you're here, just like in Minnesota, part of the Mid-Continent ISO, which goes all the way from Canada down to Louisiana, which is a power pool of power plants and other resources that are shared among all different utility companies. Some utilities sell power in, some buy power out of it, that Farmers Electric Co-op that we talked about earlier has some of their own energy supply and they buy out of this pool. They buy from other resources within Iowa or other communities. And so there's, it's not like the day that you flip the switch and the core becomes a municipal utility that you lose access to power plants. Um, you become, you're still part of this larger network in this wholesale market that you can participate in.
I think the thing, and I said this once before, but I just want to highlight, this is a, in the New York Times thing about uh, corporations in general, but I think applies it particularly important to keep in our mind and in our focus when we talk about the shape, difference between a company like Alliant Energy and service from municipal utility is that a company has a duty to shareholder value. That is their legal obligation. We should not expect them to behave in a different way. In fact, it would be wrong of them to do so. So all of the things that they do are rational for them. And the question is whether or not there is an alignment between the actions that they will take in service of that value and the actions that we want to be taken in our value. <coughs> and I see in many places, as I've shown in pictures before, and in many other communities, people are saying, we don't see that alignment anymore. We don't know how it will work. Sometimes it can, and sometimes it can't. In Minneapolis, for example, in 2013, we were running a campaign called Minneapolis Energy Options. And we said publicly that two-thirds of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the use of the electric and gas utilities. The city has a climate action plan. We wanted to reduce carbon to meet you know, climate action goals from not from Paris at that time, but from many of the other international commitments. And it was very clear that the city simply had no authority. When you know it, our utility company was regulated by the Public Utilities Commission in St. Paul, just like your IRB Utilities Board, or by the state legislature, and the city has very little influence there. And so what we said to the city is you gotta use whatever leverage you have if you're gonna be successful. And the only leverage, the only tool in most communities' toolbox is municipalization. And there's a great quote from FDR that says, effectively, you don't have to always go through with it, but if it's the only leverage tool you get have, you gotta take it out of the toolbox and swing it around a little bit. And that's kind of what we ended up doing. We had our council line up to take a vote to put it on the ballot, and the utilities came to them and said, no, 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 we wanna be good partners. Let us know how we can help align our work, our, our duty to shareholder value with the goals that you have in the community. And so far what I'd say about it is we've talked a lot. I'm not sure that we have made a lot of progress on that. And this is a good example of a thing that we're still up against, is that the utility company doesn't think there's a, a, a conflict of interest between this ask of the legislature for their shareholders and what they've promised the city of Minneapolis about climate change. And it, I have read with amusement some things that the city council have been saying to the utility of Minneapolis about what it means to be a good partner. But it's something, obviously, to keep close at heart. So I think what I would say in the end is, and I, I I think it's terrible that I have a chart here instead of some sort of inspirational picture, but what it comes down to in terms of local value is that you can do this, you can choose, you can have the choice, you should exercise that choice. It's really the only one that you have, practically speaking, right now, but it can really pay off for your community because there's a huge opportunity that is untapped, that is unconsidered by the folks that run the business now uh, that is something that you can take into account if you have that control over your energy system. Thank you very much.